The girl was chased by strange creatures, which had long arms with sharp claws, a long nose and a creepy smile in the whole face, exposing their huge, fanged mouth. The heroine ran to the edge of the cliff. There was nowhere to run further. From behind her back made scary and nasty sounds of Kikimora. The girl, folding her arms on her chest, applied the spell Physical Enchantment. The monsters were already throwing fireballs at her, but the heroine, pushed off the ground, flew down. The girl woke up in a place unknown to her, covered by someone's cloak. A boy sitting nearby heard the girl's movements and said hello to her. He was sitting near the fire. The heroine looked at him in surprise and jumped up sharply. The movement made her head hurt. She clutched her eyes and trembled a little. The guy knew that she was afraid of him, but advised her to lie down, because even though she used physical enchantment, she still fell from a great height. The girl, when the pain subsided a bit, looked at the guy perplexed. The blonde didn't understand how he knew she was using body enchantment magic, but the girl decided to still thank her savior for his help. She wanted to say something else to him, but the guy with his hand asked her to be quiet. He heard the pursuers who had already caught up with them. The guy also felt the amount of magic power. The blonde was horrified to notice that she had no magical power left to fight, for she wasn't even sure if this strange guy was her ally. The guy asked what they should do now. Turning to the girl, he asked if he could kill them all, but the blonde surprised him by saying that even the guards couldn't kill them. The guy with a crazed look asked to leave them to him. The girl was familiar with this habit. She recognized him as Sir Reinhardt, but the guy didn't hear her question. He had already gone up to deal with the chimeras. The monsters were looming over the guy, chuckling nastily. They were chimeras made by some alchemist. The black-haired guy told them that he would like to chat with them if they were decent people. The monsters raised their hands and formed circles of fire over their heads. The guy was impressed that they were going to use fire magic against him. The balls flew at the kid. When they reached him, they dissolved into thin air. The chimeras were shocked, and the blonde was also surprised because even if he had used a magic barrier, he wouldn't have been able to repel all the attacks. And the guy said confidently that he didn't need to waste his mana thanks to these guys. A fiery little salamander appeared on his shoulder. The salamander directed a huge stream of firepower at them. The chimeras ran away from her in fear. The hero, spreading his arms to the sides, began to call to the salamander, and the fiery beast grew to a huge size, exuding streams of fire, the guy ordered the huge salamander to consume the wicked with its holy flames. The girl watched him in shock, for this was the legendary spirit of fire. The chimeras trembled in fear and ran away from the salamander, but the guy pointed his hand at them and ordered them to be destroyed. The salamander opened his mouth and a powerful stream of fire erupted from his mouth, engulfing all the monsters who began to scream in pain. When they were done, the guy turned to the blonde and smiled. The girl thanked him, but the guy asked her not to worry about it. Approaching her, he pointed his palm at her and applied healing magic. The heroine was surprised, examining her hands. She yelled that nothing else hurt and asked that he could use healing magic. The guy, scratching the back of his head awkwardly, replied that he could do quite a bit. The hero introduced himself. His name was Louis Brandel, a wizard. The girl's name was Franziska Dumer. She was also a wizard. The blonde asked to call herself by her shortened name, Fran. Lewis said with a smile, it was nice to meet you. Fran smiled. She hadn't heard that name before, thanking the guy again for his help. She asked him what he was doing in the woods. The guy said that his grandfather had recently passed away, so he decided to leave and go traveling. Before that, the guy lost his memory ten years ago, and his grandfather from the Arlv species picked him up. The Arlv are a species that are also called elves. They used to be those who served the gods, and as the girl remembered, they were long-lived. There was one elf in their school, too. Louis went on to talk about his grandfather, that he always told him that the forest gave knowledge, because there were many fairies and animals in the forest. His grandfather told the boy that he should be friends with them. Fran warily asked that even with beasts you have to be friends. Louis nonchalantly said yes, and told her that she then fell into his seat as he slept. The girl blurted out that she thought she was going to be killed. Then the guy inquired who she was. Francisca was a noblewoman from the kingdom of Valentine. 
she is a student at a magical school for girls in the capital city of St. Helena. The blonde was in training in the country next door when the monsters attacked them. The girl survived, but she was sad and worried about the knights. Louis listened carefully to Fran and promised to help her get to St. Helena. The hero happily decided to protect the girl as a substitute and asked that it be left up to him. Fran awkwardly began to yell that she felt bad because he had already saved her, so she couldn't demand more. Louis replied that he didn't have any goals anyway and also told her that after how they would get there, he would become adventurous. Francisco was surprised by this statement. Guy went on to say that he had heard that there was a town called Bartland in Valentine where all the adventurers were. The girl confirmed this, but she didn't want him to become an adventurer. Because if Louis became adventurous, she wouldn't meet him again. The guy waited for her to continue talking, but the girl kept thinking about the fact that maybe with this man, it would be possible to convince the one she needed. The hero, scratching the back of his head nonchalantly, heard that magic users were important in the adventurer clan. Francisca ducked her face into his knee and answered him no. The guy didn't understand her. Then the girl jumped up sharply and shouted that he couldn't do that. The boy incomprehensibly asked why he couldn't. Fran pounced on him and threateningly began to tell him that he couldn't become an adventurer. Louis still didn't understand why. The blonde angrily replied that his talent in magic was excellent. The protagonist didn't believe her much because his grandfather always told him he was still a beginner. Francisca, holding him by the shoulders, said demandingly that he should become a teacher at the magical school for girls in Valentine. It was all so abruptly unexpected that the guy didn't realize anything. The blonde kept insisting that he should become a teacher in their academy anyway. The guy asked her to calm down and suddenly it was morning. Francisca woke up stretching. She didn't even remember when she had time to fall asleep. Louis saw that the girl was awake and asked if she wanted breakfast, but he had portable food, nothing special. The girl agreed and thanked the guy. She remembered how assertive she had been yesterday and wondered how she could have behaved so rudely. Louis, remembering, informed her that when she finished eating, they would go to the place where she had been attacked. Francisca was surprised. Louis, holding Fran tightly by the waist, flew through the sky. The girl was impressed that the guy could use the magic of flight, but it confused her a little. Louis, laughing, replied that all Arlves could do that. The attack took place on a large street. Francisca, pressed against Louis's chest and covered her eyes, remembered that only advanced wizards could use flight magic. They used the power of the wind spirit. Suddenly, the girl heard the pounding of the guy's heart. The blonde asked why his heart was pounding so frantically. Louis, blushing, embarrassed, replied that it was the first time he had ever seen a human girl. He admitted that she had a nice smell and was cute. An awkward silence hung between them. Fran suddenly remembered something and asked Louis how old his grandfather was. The guy raised his head thoughtfully and said that his grandfather was the oldest of the Arlves. He thought he was 7,000 years old. The girl was surprised and the hero said that he lived in the era of the gods. Francisca asked if he had any titles. Louis cheerfully replied that he ruled over all the Arlves. The girl was surprised and frightened, for the lad had been taught by such a powerful man for ten years. The girl wanted to ask something else, but they saw the mutilated bodies of the knights. There were charred bodies of monsters on the ground, and the bodies of soldiers. Some of them were missing half of their bodies, arms, heads, etc. Lewis carried them and put them in order. The girl was upset. She was trembling and almost crying. The guy, looking at the bodies, said that there were a lot of injuries. Fran thanked Louis. The protagonist thought about collecting the items, but he couldn't leave it like that because the knights could become undead if they were eaten by monsters, and their bodies couldn't be ruined after defending them at the cost of their lives. The girl almost cried as she folded her hands in a lock and leaned over the knights. Louis looked at her and lifted himself off the ground, and began to speak an incantation. Essence that takes life forms, that unites bodies and souls, and ascends to heaven. Grant me the power to return bodies. Mother Earth, show the way to their lost souls.
The bodies of the knights began to vaporize and rise into the sky. Francisca and Louis saw them off with a glance. After, their armor remained empty. The boy, looking at his bracelet, offered the girl to take the remains of the monsters. The blonde asked about the bracelet. Louis explained that it was a bracelet enchanted with vault magic. It held many things. The guys flew to Valentine's capital city of St. Helena. The guy was impressed and announced that he couldn't enter the city that way, so they had to go down, somewhere not far away. Fran looked at him and apologized for what she had said yesterday, for she had asked him to be a teacher so suddenly. She squeezed his cloak and admitted that his talent was something great to learn. But Louis doubted he could become a teacher and whether he would be like his grandfather. Francisca replied that she understood he wanted to live freely, but asked him to at least go with her and listen to their story. The boy easily agreed because he also wanted to hear her story. They arrived at the north gate. The knights guarding it called out my lady in surprise and asked what had happened to her. The girl smiled and thanked them for their concern. She said she would tell the captain the story in detail and asked if they could go with her to her mansion. The knight agreed, but glaring menacingly at the boy, asked who it was. Fran replied that he was her savior and asked not to be rude to him. The soldiers agreed but were still wary of Louis. The blonde and the wizard rode in the carriage. She asked him if he was upset by the knight's treatment. The guy replied that he wasn't upset one bit. Francisca sadly explained that their capital city was a place where they mainly catered to the social classes, so her country was very strict about foreigners at the entrance. Francisca perked up and smilingly invited Louis to her mansion because she needed him to explain to her mother. The boy agreed with a smile and asked her to keep it to herself. The girl smiled embarrassedly. They arrived at the Doomer mansion and were greeted by Zeman, the butler of the Doomer house, a bald, serious old man with a gray beard. Zeman frowned his eyebrows as he saw the girl and the boy get out of the carriage. Fran and Louis approached the butler. The man was pleased that the lady was fine. The girl thanked Zemont and assumed that he had heard everything from the guards. The man confirmed and said that he had already told Madame everything. But the girl's mother said to let only her daughter in, and frowned and asked who the man was. Francisca looked at him incomprehensibly and said that she had told the guards about him. The butler replied that he had only been told that her guards had died after the attack. Fran angrily said she would tell her mother that he was her savior as well as a witness. But the old man, frowning his white eyebrows even more, said they couldn't let someone so poor inside and offered to give him money and send him back. Zeman also said that even if my lady asked, he still couldn't let someone unknown like him in. The girl stirred and was about to yell at the butler, but Louis's hand rested on her shoulder. Fran turned to him in surprise and apologized for being rude. The protagonist asked her not to worry. Zemont frowned and angrily asked the stranger how he dared to touch my lady. The guy apologized for it but said he was wrong. Louis said it was their first time meeting and he might look poor. He understood his cautions but didn't understand why the butler didn't trust Fran. The man became angry and asked what he had said. The wizard replied that Zeman did not inform Madame of what happened to Fran because his aura changes when talking about the guards. The maids in the background stood frightened. The butler didn't understand what Aura Louis was talking about. The guy laughed and said that the Aura didn't lie. He understood that Zeman was worried about Madame, but if anything happened here, they would all be in danger. The man clenched his hand into a fist, angrily called the guy a petty brat, replied that he didn't even know how hard it was to defend her, and swung his hand at him, shouting how dare he talk to him like that. Francisca covered her mouth with her hands in shock. Louis dodged the butler's blow. Zeman tried to hit the guy a few more times, but the wizard kept dodging his lunges. The maids were surprised that the lad was dodging Mr. Zemont's blows. The butler, in a swing, shouted for the lad to fight like a man. Louis cheerfully agreed, and when the man swung at him with his fist, the lad squatted down and struck the butler in the butt with all his might. Zeman fell to the ground in pain holding his stomach, saying that his body was so easy to puncture. But Louis answered him that he lost because he didn't think the guy would be stronger than him. The man became frantic and wasn't serious. Louis realized that the butler did it for Fran. Zemont laughed. It embarrassed him. The guy could have easily killed him. He planned to hit him, but he could see through it. 
The butler turned to my lady, trembling, wanted to apologize to the girl, but fainted. Francisca jumped up to him, frightened. The guy calmed the blonde, saying that everything was fine and offered to cure him. But suddenly Fran's mother appeared. She angrily asked her daughter why Zeman was lying down and demanded an explanation from her. Fran's mother was the chairwoman of the Earl Adelaide Dumer Magical Academy for Girls. The daughter excitedly wanted to tell everything. Adelaide was surprised to notice that she could feel the butler was alive. But Fran wouldn't be able to use such attack magic. Then her gaze stopped on the boy. The woman walked quickly over to Louis and stared at him frowningly as she came close. The boy stared at her in surprise, the maids excitedly asking Madame to step back. The woman regarded the stranger thoughtfully. She felt no threatening power from him. Francisca called loudly to her mother and asked her to get behind Louis. Adelaide continued to examine the boy. He was tall and thin but had great agility. Taking a closer look at his black hair and eyes that were human, but not from this country, the woman assumed he might have been of Eastern blood. But she felt no end to his magical power. Adelaide didn't understand what kind of atmosphere hovered around him. Louis, humming, said that the woman had beautiful eyes. Adelaide was surprised but didn't say anything. The boy said he needed to heal the butler, for he was the one who had injured her servant. The woman excitedly asked him to wait. But the guy had already bent over the old man and began to speak a spell. Adelaide looked at him in surprise because she had heard the chanting of spiritual magic. The woman couldn't believe it because there weren't many people who used it. The woman looked at the wizard, thinking that even the Arlves that were the best at using her couldn't use her perfectly. Zimon came to his senses. He jumped up sharply when he saw the madam. The woman inquired about his injury. The man abruptly noticed that his pain was gone. Francisca awkwardly intervened and said she had something to tell her mother. Adelaide looked at the boy, turned to her daughter with a smile, and said she should tell her about him with all the details. They sat in Adelaide's office. Louis and Fran told the woman that Zeman's countdown was incomplete. His mother understood his feelings, but it was just a waste of time, and she wanted to spend more time exploring. The girl's mom always said that. Her daughter rebuked her for always being in the lab when she was bored. The woman was a fan of magic and laughed, Adelaide said thoughtfully. Creatures that use magic are interesting. Lewis told her that he had collected their bodies when he was collecting the remains of the knights. The woman was surprised. The wizard asked Fran if he could get them here. The blonde agreed. Her mother was impressed that it was all in a bracelet and demanded to show her. The girl stood and watched them. Francisca was scared, but did not know why because the monsters were already dead. She convinced herself that it was not scary, because her mom and Louis were with her. But before her eyes appeared the creepy faces of the chimera, and the girl was seized with horror and fear. She fell sharply to the floor and trembled her whole body. Her mother and Louis turned to look at her in surprise. Fran became delirious. The wizard quickly approached her and grabbed her hands and asked her to calm down, after all they were here. Francisca took the guy's hand hard and scratched his skin with her fingernail. The woman yelled angrily at her daughter, but Louis asked her to leave it on him. The blonde woman called Louis and tearfully asked him not to leave her alone. The wizard looked at her and gently ran his hand over her cheek, promising not to leave her, moved his hand to the back of her head, and leaning closer to her, pressed his forehead against hers and used remission, calming magic. Fran calmed down and fell asleep. Her mother squatted down and apologized to Louis, but the boy replied that it was he who had been too careless. Francisca was lying in bed with a maid beside her. Louis showed the dead chimeras to Adelaide. The woman sat down closer to them and noticed that they looked like goblins. The boy assumed they were based on homunculi and mixed with the spirits of dead humans and goblins. The guy asked why they were after Fran. The woman replied that there were many reasons such as the hero's descendant had Doomer's blood and had developed early as a magic user, and buying people's envy wasn't that hard. Pride and pretense were frequent qualities in noble families, Adelaide thought, and sadly told Louis that her daughter was involved because of her. She bowed low to the wizard and thanked the guy again for saving her daughter. The woman slyly admitted that she would be very grateful if he told her about his circumstances, his spiritual magic, and anything else. Louis awkwardly replied that he had already told Fran everything. 
But the guy was made to tell it again, and the woman was very impressed that Louis could use all the magical elements. She sat there shocked, the wizard confirmed this, and said he had been blessed by many great spirits so he could use all earth, water, air, and fire. Normally in their world there would only be a primary and secondary element. Lewis cheerfully said he was the fourth in the last 7,000 years. There used to be more. Lewis asked the woman what he should do now. He had planned to become an adventurer here in Valentine because he wanted to see the fullness of this vast world. But Fran asked him to become a teacher at their school. The woman was pleasantly surprised. The guy, remembering the girl's crying face and the request not to leave her, asked if he should leave here. Adelaide smiled and thanked him that he was really worried about her daughter. She admitted that his talent in magic was something incredible, and if he became a teacher at her academy, it would make her extremely happy. He would be happy about it, but this was his adventure, and he was determined to choose for himself. Louis looked at her sadly. The woman slyly admitted that her intention was to keep him here so he could help her with many things and experiments in magic. But the boy doubted, because his grandfather always called him a beginner in magic. He didn't know if someone like him could be a teacher. The woman giggled and said that he said very funny things, having such a talent. The wizard looked at her incomprehensibly. Adelaide said thoughtfully that if he taught the same way his grandfather did, he might discover something new. The woman noticed that Louis had bits of knowledge from great interpretation, so she wanted him to teach her students that. Taught them magic the same way his grandfather had taught him. And also, Adelaide noticed that he was a very different person to her daughter, because they had only recently met. But she had never seen that look on his face before. Louis remembered the happy face of the girl. The woman had calmly warned him that she didn't demand an answer from him immediately. He could still think about it. But the wizard interrupted her and said firmly that he wanted to try. The boy, leaning slightly forward and placing his hands loosely on his knees, confidently asked to be made a teacher at Valentine's Magical Academy for Girls. Adelaide was looking for something among the books on the shelves, saying that this was how everyday life was at the academy, and also they only had one male teacher at the academy, the rest were girls. The woman happily turned to him and announced that they now had to decide what subjects the boy would teach. At their school, each teacher taught their own subjects, but each had to have a specialized subject. Lewis listened intently to the woman. The first was spiritual magic, which Louis used was difficult to master and few people could use it. It was activated by asking the spirits for power, very effective but difficult to use because it used the forces of nature. Also, their school taught magic formulas to activate magic in a simplified form. There was a familiar way of activating magic, its effect inferior to spiritual magic, but easier to apply. The woman placed a huge stack of books about magic formulas in front of the boy and asked if he would memorize them. Lewis needed to look at the magic formulas, then activate them, and he would probably be able to use the rest without pronouncing them. The wizard, books in hand, asked how he should conduct his lessons. Adelaide replied that everyone had their own style. The woman thoughtfully suggested that when giving lessons, he should just be himself because this Fran was so relaxed around him. The boy asked in surprise what she meant by that Fran. Adelaide thought sadly and replied that Francisca was once supposed to be married to a fiancé of her own choosing. Louis listened sadly to the story. The woman went on to say that in this country every nobleman, if there is a good match, marries or is married as early as possible. Twelve years ago, when Fran was ten, her mother decided to find her a groom, he was the second son of Countess Saru, who was eight years older than her. After the engagement, the groom often came to her, and even Fran, as a child, did not dote on him. But the fateful day came, the Great Destruction, a disaster that came to their world out of the blue. It could be a strong storm or a powerful surge of demon activity. Lewis thoughtfully remembered that they called the Great Destruction in the land of Arlv Divine Wrath. Adelaide noticed the wizard's thoughtful look and argued that he seemed to have heard something about it. Ten years ago, the Great Destruction began in St. Helena. Hordes of ferocious wyverns attacked the capital of the kingdom. Then Fran's fiancé was a knight of the royal guard and was ordered to go to war. The boy promised the girl he would definitely protect her and return alive. 
The wyverns fought back, not least thanks to the royal guards, but he was in the middle of the battle protecting his comrades when a wyvern tore him to pieces. The boy died in the battle. Louis sat sad, Adelaide holding a cup of tea in her hand, suggested that perhaps it was because of the trauma of losing a loved one in the past. Fran had become a little fragile mentally. The girl cried every day. Her cheerful and cheerful character changed. She began to be interested only in learning magic. She was ranked number one in school, graduated from the College of Magic, and gained a lot of influence in many circles. But for some reason, she wanted to return to the academy as a teacher. But she didn't even tell her mom the reason. There was a gloomy atmosphere in her classes, and the students did not like her very much. Adelaide, putting the cup on the table, said that as a mother, she was very worried about her future. But, abruptly placing her hands on the table and looming over the guy, she exclaimed joyfully that Louis had then appeared and saved her. The guy awkwardly replied that it was an accident, but the woman stood her ground and said it was fate. She had no fortune-telling magic, but her instincts were pretty good and her connections good. Adelaide said he was their gift to them, her daughter, and their school. In short, the best guest ever. Francisca woke up and couldn't realize when she had fallen asleep, but she quickly remembered that when they had looked at the mutilated bodies, she had had a nervous breakdown. She stormed sharply into her mother's study. Louis greeted her with a smile. He carried the plates to the table and asked Fran if she was feeling better already. Her mother saw her daughter and greeted her cheerfully as well. The girl was a little taken aback. Adelaide noticed that her daughter looked better. Francisca quickly said good morning and asked her mom what happened. Her mom noticed Fran's worried look and with a sly face asked her why she stopped acting like a lady. She asked her not to worry because Louis got a job with them as a temporary teacher. The girl asked the wizard if it was true. He smiled sweetly at her. The girl jumped up, raised her hands up, shouted, Hurrah! The maids that were in the room were surprised at my lady's behavior. She was very happy. Adelaide suggested that the three of them go to school after breakfast, because it was spring break, so they could take a tour of the academy. They arrived at the magic school for girls. The boy was thrilled that the building was big and it was full of awesome magic. Fran told him that the main building had five floors, with classrooms on the second and third floor. Francisca went on to say that on the fourth floor was the principal's office, the vice principal's office, the meeting room, and this teacher's lounge where they were now standing. This was where the boy would have his place. Adelaide informed Louis that the semester would begin in three days, and she would like the wizard to attend Fran's classes as an intern. The girl looked at the guy with embarrassment and thought that she was really going to be teaching with Louis. It was starting to make her nervous. A girl walked into the office and greeted them all. It was Adelina Coletta, the new teacher. She anxiously asked the chairperson and principal if she was working on her day off too. Adelaide greeted the girl and noticed that she had come early. Fran somehow slumped and with her head down also greeted the new teacher. Adelina saw Louis and asked Adelaide who it was. The woman introduced the boy and said that Louis as well as her would be teachers from this year. The wizard greeted the girl cheerfully and introduced himself. Adeline stood in shock at the fact that he called her by her name out of the blue and at his unceremonious behavior. Adelaide was surprised by the teacher's stupor and asked her why she didn't say hello. The girl decided that whoever the guy was, she should greet him normally because she had to leave a good impression. Coletta bowed sharply to the guy and stammered a greeting. There was silence after her violent introduction, and the girl was very ashamed of herself. Louis put his hand on her shoulder and asked her not to be so nervous. He called Adelina a good girl because he could see it in her aura. Coletta gave him an embarrassed look and shook the wizard's hand. Fran got a wildly confused feeling from their friendly greetings. Coletta was laughing at the guy, and the blonde could see that she wasn't just saying hello to Louis, and Louis was so friendly to everyone. She wasn't happy. Adeline turned to tell her that they would see each other in three days, but when she saw the blonde's intimidating face, she was scared. Louis laughed at the sight of her and said that she had a funny face, but she was scaring Adeline. Francisca made a normal face and hastily apologized to the girl. The wizard turned to Colette and asked her not to be afraid of Fran. Adelina looked at him confused and replied that she didn't even think of being afraid. Fran grew sad. Her mother noticed it. They were on the fifth floor and Adelaide, apologizing, 
told the wizard that she and Fran needed to talk alone, so she asked him to have tea without them and wait for them for a while. The boy agreed. The woman sternly called her daughter by her full name and asked if she knew why she had hired Lewis as a temporary teacher. The girl thoughtfully replied that it was because his internship would be over in a year and they would officially hire him. Mom shook her head negatively and told him that when Lewis left Arlv, he did it to see the world, so you can't keep him just because it was convenient for them. And, if after a year Lewis wanted to leave, Mom offered to let him go. Fran, clutching her bow on her dress, understood what Mama was saying, but she was so glad he was staying. Adelaide said Louis didn't realize. How outstanding a wizard he was because his tutor, Sowell, kept telling him he wasn't ready. His mother was sure he was doing it so the boy wouldn't get cocky. Adelaide seriously asked her daughter if she understood how she felt about Louis. She had lost Reinhardt. Her mother suggested that her daughter was just trying to fill the resulting void with Louis. Fran was upset. She replied that she didn't know how she felt. It was just that Louis had said the same words to her that Reinhardt had said, so she hadn't stopped thinking about him. Adelaide stared at her and said that Louis was just showing signs of attention. He wasn't in love with her. Franziska completely wilted, and her mother went on to say that she wasn't in love with him either, because she wanted Reinhardt, not Louis. Adelaide watched Fran for a moment, then came up to her and said that love was illogical. Her mother grabbed the girl by the shoulders and told her that if she wanted to love Louis, and for him to love her, she needed to communicate more with him and make more effort, advising her to get to know him better and get to know herself, for starters. After all, unlike Reinhardt, Franziska had met Louis herself, so she must decide for herself whether she wanted to be with him. The girl looked at her mother in surprise. She was confused. Adelaide, with a sly face, warned that if the hero refused her, she would have to put up with it. Her mother walked over to her daughter, patted her shoulder reassuringly, and told her that Louis had an incredible talent for magic. So it was okay to compete with him in a friendly way. The woman was sure it would be good for the students and the school. Adelaide advised her daughter to think about it. They returned to the study in Louis. The boy was reading a book. The woman apologized for being late. The wizard replied that it was nothing. Francisca followed her mother's advice and began to show more attention to the guy, but not exactly as her mother said. The girl stared at Louis, and the protagonist stared back at her incomprehensibly. The girl decided to stare insistently at Louis. Her mother watching her thought her daughter was very naive and she didn't mean it. Adelaide and Francisca sat down at the couch across from the wizard. The headmistress informed the boy that the captain of the royal guard was coming over tonight because he wanted to ask him about the attack on Fran. The woman warned that they would only ask about him, so he shouldn't have revealed all of his abilities. But St. Helens carefully vets outsiders, Louis asked what he should do. Adelaide suggested telling them that the boy was Fran's servant. The daughter looked at her mother in surprise. The woman asked Louis if he minded. The girl couldn't stand it and said that Louis shouldn't be treated like that because they were no better than slaves. But Louis intervened and said it was okay and asked them to trust him because he was willing and promised that whether there were 10,000 or just one, he was still willing to protect Fran at any cost. Adelaide said that was a good answer. Francisca looked at the wizard in surprise and embarrassment. She urged herself to keep her emotions at bay. Her mother gave her a sly chuckle. Louis looked at her incomprehensibly. The woman thanked the guy, saying she thought it would work. A temporary teacher at the school and serving as Fran's bodyguard. She was about to say something else, but there was a sudden knock on the door. A voice came from behind the door. Franziska grimaced and said it was the vice principal. Louis asked again. Adelaide said her name was Altsvara, a teacher from the Arlv race. The woman realized they were busy, but it was the only way. So she asked her daughter to open the door. Fran reluctantly agreed. She opened the door, and a beautiful elf entered the room. Her name was Kelturi Eiltsvara. She was the deputy director. Kelturi noticed that the principal was also in the office and apologized. Louis called the deputy by the abbreviated name Kelly in surprise. He was glad to see her, since they hadn't seen each other in a long time. The woman was also surprised to see Louis standing in front of her. They knew each other and Fran was immediately wary, wondering what their relationship was. Kelly couldn't believe that Louis was here. Adelaide asked if they knew each other, 
The boy happily turned to the woman and said that his grandfather had introduced them. Adelaide was surprised and asked Kelly why she hadn't said anything. The elfess awkwardly looked away and replied that it was because she hadn't asked her. Adelaide clutched her head tiredly with her hand. She couldn't believe that Kelly had even kept this from her. After all, she knew nothing bad would have happened if she had told her. Louis guessed and asked the woman if she had called Kelly to this academy. It was true, and the woman told him that she was then called an educated girl from the Valentine Magical School for Girls. When she visited the school, she was able to convince the elf to become a teacher at a magic academy for girls. Kelturi, thanks to her astounding genius, had become vice principal in two years. All this time, Kelly stood frowning and a little embarrassed. The lad was amazed at the elf's abilities. The deputy herself lowered her head and said that the chairman flattered her, but that was the truth, and the woman asked with a smile at their relationship with Louis. Louis and Kelly shouted together. Only Kelturi angrily replied that they weren't related in any way, and the guy cheerfully replied that they were practicing together. Francisca looked at them in surprise. Adelaide slyly remarked that they were teacher and student of sorts, but the pixie exclaimed menacingly that it was just a normal training session. Lewis said, with a wide grin that he was having a lot of fun, Kelly turned on him angrily and asked him to shut up already. Fran watched them. The vice principal was always unwavering, so the girl had never once seen that expression on her face. She could see that Louis was having fun too. It was like they had opened up to each other. So Francisca thought sadly that Kelly knew a lot more about Louis than she did. Louis called out to Kelly and said that they were very worried about her because she had suddenly disappeared five years ago. He worriedly asked what had happened then. The elf was upset about something, so she didn't answer the reason for her disappearance. Fran watched her excitedly, but the awkward silence was interrupted by Adelaide saying that she knew they had their own circumstances. But that was even good. And given those circumstances, the woman suggested that the Elfess make Louis a follower of Fran. Kelly was in huge shock. She looked angrily at the guy and then calmed down a bit and asked why her. The woman cheerfully replied that since she was the deputy director, she could introduce him to Fran to become a follower. In fact, her presence was supposed to make everything more convincing. The elf shouted nervously why she would do that. The woman calmly replied that because he was her glorious training partner, besides it wasn't that hard. Adelaide teased Kelly, saying that was it really such an impossible task for her. The elven woman gave up in front of the headmistress, lowering her head and grudgingly agreeing. The woman thanked the deputy cheerfully and would now address her by her first name as a thank you. Louis put his hand on her shoulder and thanked Kelly with a smile. It was two o'clock in the afternoon and the captain and his aides were walking down the hall at Countess Dummer's estate. At the head walked an officer of the Royal Knights of the Kingdom of Valentine, Kelvin Ryan, the Earl. Adelaide hugged the captain and greeted him. The man thanked the woman for accepting. Calvin said with a sad face that what had happened today was a nightmare. He would never have thought they would be attacked by those creatures. Adelaide replied that they would remember the five knights who had died protecting Fran. The woman informed the captain that she had news regarding Fran. Someone wanted to become a follower of Francis and protect her. Adelaide sent Calvin to the guest room. The captain and Adelaide sat on the couches. The woman called Louis and Fran over. Francisca entered first and greeted everyone, followed by the wizard. The girl apologized to Calvin that he had to come because of her. The man stood up from his seat and asked her not to apologize because of that. The captain said with a sympathetic face that these knights lived their lives protecting what was dear to them, so he was sure they could rest in peace knowing they were able to protect her. Fran admitted that she was relieved by his words. The man noticed that the girl looked tired, but still looked much better now. He saw Louis standing a little further away and realized it was her follower. He looked very elegant and tall, but it didn't look like he knew how to use weapons, he was a bit doubtful that this guy had defeated those nightmare monsters. Adelaide asked Louis to introduce himself. The boy walked up to the captain, bowed down on one knee, and formally introduced himself to him. The man was shocked. The woman walked over and called out to him. Calvin replied that it was fine, it was just unexpected for him, and asked Louis to tell him about the incident. He told him everything. 
The captain said he got the gist of the situation. Adelaide told him everything with a smile, that Louis was an orphan from the human race, but he had grown up in the village of Arlv. The Kelturi spoke very highly of him and had appointed the lad as a temporary teacher. Calvin thoughtfully asked the wizard to come over to him. The guy walked over and the captain grabbed his shoulder, frowning. Fran got worried, jumping up, nervously asking what he was doing and asking him to stop. The girl was afraid it would be like with Zeman, but the captain, clutching Louis tightly, noticed that he had good arms, and though he was skinny, he was trained perfectly. He asked him if he had maybe been through some special training, but Louis hadn't been through anything. The girl frowned at them. The man cheerfully said that it would be great if he fought his subordinates. His subordinates standing behind him were not thrilled with the idea. Lewis agreed, saying he would at the earliest opportunity, then Calvin happily wanted to set a date already. But he was loudly called out by Adelaide and angrily asked if they couldn't leave this conversation for later. The man immediately apologized for his habit. Adelaide and the boys saw the captain off. He was taking the remains with him. The woman said they were counting on him. The man took one last look at Louis and Fran and remarked in surprise that Louis had dispelled Francisca's darkness. And even the adamant Zeman took it for granted. He recognized that Adelaide had found a wonderful man. The captain had met many people in his life, but only in his eyes he saw no malice. Louis even mourned for those Calvin had lost, and he may not have been a knight, but he was a fine young man who understood the way of the knight. Calvin, sitting in the carriage, thought with peace of mind that even Adelaide trusted him, and he would be watching him. The next day, Francisca and Louis were going somewhere together. Zemont asked my lady if he should prepare a carriage. The girl replied that it was not necessary, because today was a wonderful weather, and she and Louis just go to the shopping center. The butler seriously told the lad that he trusted Fran with him. The wizard replied with a smile that he could count on him. The man loomed over the guy intimidatingly and told him that he would have to tell him about the strange technique he was using. The blonde excitedly noticed that Zeman had that belligerent look in his eyes again. The people of the city turned around the couple Louis and Francisca in surprise. They were beautiful. The wizard was mesmerized by the city. There were a lot of people and it was very lively. He confessed to the girl that at first he had wondered where he would find lodging, but he was very glad that Adelaide had allowed him to live with them. Fran had agreed with the wizard because she felt safe with him. The girl happily announced that they needed to buy Louis some clothes today. She was ready to pick him something really nice. The guy smiled at her and said he would prefer simple clothes because he didn't think formal clothes would suit him. Suddenly some strange guy stood in front of Fran and leaned close to her face. With a nasty face, he said that she was very pretty. Louis watched him. The girl stared at him in surprise. This weird guy suggested Fran ditch this kid and have some fun with them. He pulled his hands in her, but Louis covered Francisca with himself. The slippery guy with the goatee and long hair tied back in a ponytail asked what he wanted and chased him away. Louis stared at him in surprise. The guy swung around and yelled for him to get out, but the wizard grabbed his fist and squeezed painfully. The gang leader wriggled and screamed in pain. His sixes hissed and wanted to engage. Louis wriggled his arm, turned him around to face the boys, and seriously told him he wanted to talk to him alone, so demanded he tell his henchmen to hold still because they were annoying. The nasty kid squealed in fear to his boys to stand still. The guy praised him, calling him a good boy, turned to Fran and informed her that he would like to talk to him, so he asked her to wait a bit. The girl excitedly agreed. She worriedly wondered if this was normal. Luis took the boy around the corner and asked his name and age. The boy's name was Barubi Uzaru, and he was 17 years old, very young, Louis noticed. Barubi sent him and said he was Baron Barubi's son. Louis told him that it was none of his father's business and asked him how he usually acted in such situations. Uzaru turned away from him and remained silent. The wizard was still holding his fist, so he squeezed it hard again. Barubi screamed and decided to tell him after all. He started crying and snotting and said that he was a sophomore at the Royal Academy for Boys. Sometimes he wants to have fun with the girls. Louis had seen him and his henchmen bullying the girls. The wizard gritted his teeth, covering his face with his hand, asking if he was the one with his henchmen, and there were even more of them. The guy didn't understand what he was talking about. The boy looked at him menacingly and told him that he had gotten into his mind through magic 
and had seen him abusing girls and selling them into slavery and his father hiding all his atrocities, Uzaru was horrified and asked how he knew. Francisca watched them and wondered what they were talking about. She couldn't hear them at this distance. Lewis called him a monster. He had no self-respect at all and promised that he would turn him in to the guards or the knights. Lewis warned Uzaru threateningly that even though he was only considered a follower of Fran, but if he ever came near her again, he and his minions, like his father, would disappear. He squeezed Uzaru's hand with all his might. The wizard eerily noted that there were some very interesting images in his heart. Or rather, he saw that the guy's head had been ripped off and torn in half. Lewis promised that he would do the same if he blabbed, lastly warning him to remember that. The nasty kid nodded his head vigorously. The guy let go of his fist and Uzaru slumped shamefully on his heel. He sat fearfully in front of Louis, the wizard glaring menacingly at his hexes. They were already in full preparation for the fight. The guy already wanted to go too, but from behind he heard the shouts of the knights who were running and asking them to stop fighting. The bad guys were disappointed to have missed such a good moment. Franziska ran up to Louis and asked if he was all right. The guy confirmed with a smile that everything was fine, because it was more important to him that Fran was all right. The girl thanked him. From around the corner, two girls were watching them. One of them asked Olga in a whisper if Iron Mask, that's what they called Francisca, was definitely there. Olga answered Michelle that it was definitely her. In lectures, they remembered her as gloomy and emotionless. But now they saw that she was having more fun than ever. Another suggested that it might be because of the guy next to her. They wondered who this guy was. His clothes were like a noble's, so they assumed it was a follower of hers. The girls completely hid behind the wall. They were very curious as to where their teacher and her follower were headed. They decided to put an end to their plans and mess with Iron Mask a bit. Francisca was glad that the guards arrived in time, because thanks to them, the situation had not escalated. Louis agreed with her. The guy sensed that they were being followed and turned around. The girl asked what happened, but the wizard didn't tell her anything. Louis noticed the two girls, but he didn't think they wanted to hurt them, so he decided to ignore them. Fran and Louis arrived at the Kingsley Capital Branch. At the entrance, a man greeted them. It was the owner of the Kingsley Capital Branch, Marco Fonti. Francisca also greeted the owner. The man asked her what they needed today. The girl cheerfully said that today... They would be shopping for her follower and gave his name. Marco bowed low to the guy and said it was a pleasure to meet him, greeted him and introduced himself. The guy did the same. Having finished with all the formalities, the owner asked what they needed. Lewis was excited and said that he would be a teacher at a magical academy for girls starting this spring. So he wanted something fancy and he wouldn't be comfortable in these clothes. Then the owner, writing everything down in his notebook, clarified that he needed to prepare some options of leather robes and simple clothes, the guy confirmed it. The owner said he needed to take his measurements, so he asked them to follow him. They should discuss the material for his clothes. The girls were watching them outside the door at this point. Louis had asked the owner something in his ear before, and Marco had agreed. Marco bowed to Louis and went to the assistant to tell about the guy's request. Fran approached the wizard and asked him what he told him, the guy hesitated, winked at the girl, raised his index finger to his lips, and said that it was a secret for the next client. Louis and Fran went inside. The girls saw this and decided to follow them, but they were met on the doorstep by a friendly store employee. She greeted them with a smile and said that Lady Francisca had been talking about them, and while she was shopping, the girl would treat them to tea in the next room. The girls were shocked and wanted to refuse, but they were forcibly led into the room. They took measurements from Louis, and afterward Marco laid before them the skin of a dragon that had long ago fallen at the hand of a hero. It was the pride of this branch. The owner with a smile named the amount, costing such materials three divine gold or 30,000 gold coins. The girl's jaw dropped from such a price. After all, 30,000 gold would be enough to buy two estates. She looked at Louis in surprise, and wondered what Marco was thinking, because Louis would definitely not be able to afford one of those. But Louis cheerfully remarked that he already had something similar. The owner was puzzled. Then the guy removed his jacket sleeve and showed his bracelet. His material would be even better than the one offered by the owner. 
Marco asked in surprise where he had gotten it from. The girl was surprised to observe that Louis's pelt emitted a much more powerful energy than Marco's material. The wizard said that his old man had passed it on to him and asked the owner how he thought this pelt was enough to sew something for him and Fran. But the owner stood astonished and looked at Louis's skin. He was impressed. The guy was here for the first time, so he wanted to show their best product but he couldn't believe that Louis the wizard had brought something even better. Marco wondered who he was, hurriedly saying that he would get the master. The man asked him to wait for him and ran off. The owner brought in a scowling dwarf, a dwarf master weaponsmith named Olvo Gilden, who scrutinized Louis's skin. He was shocked, to say the least, for this was the skin of a true dragon king who lived in the Age of the Gods. Francisca asked if it was the one they told about in the myths. The dwarf confirmed this and said that it was priceless. You were told that the true dragon king was the strongest elf in history, and Sowl had defeated him. The dwarf went on to say that they didn't get along with them dwarves, so they made up this story. The girl, looking at Louis in surprise, thought that Sowl was Louis's grandfather. The wizard told Olvo that he was in a close relationship with some of the elves and asked if he would do it for him. The dwarf replied, that under normal circumstances he would rather die than do anything for the much-hated elves. But it was an incredibly rare treasure, but one he couldn't just turn a blind eye to, so he resolutely said he was taking the job. But there was something else, the guy awkwardly said, that he didn't know if he had enough money. He hadn't thought about it. The dwarf and Marco looked at each other in surprise and exclaimed happily that Louis could care less about the expense for it had been a long time since they had been so enthusiastic about something. The wizard thanked them cheerfully. Francisca looked at Louis and thought that the wizard was very protective of her. He was strong and reliable, calm and good-natured. The girl was embarrassed to note that she loved everything about him. In the Kingsley admissions office sat Olga Flavini and Michelle Estra. The girls were in their second year at the Magical Academy School for Girls. They sat there scared and thought that what was happening was very bad for them. They were in a panic thinking that if the academy found out that they were spying on the principal, they would get angry and say that it was inappropriate behavior for a lady. They were already thinking that they would either be suspended or kicked out altogether. Francisca came into the room and greeted her students with a smile. The girls jumped with fright and hugged each other, both of them stammering their greetings and the principal's nickname. The girls were still intimidated by Fran's smile, because the Iron Mask never smiled in class. The other girl panicked, thinking it was a fake smile, and she must have been furious. But the principal apologized to them for keeping them waiting, and informing them that she would like them to meet their new teacher. Louis came into the room and introduced himself. The students tearfully introduced themselves to the new teacher. Louis told Fran that they were following them, Michelle hastily replied that they were just being carried along. Olga said that they weren't going to peek at them. Francisca told them that she didn't want that kind of attention from her students and promised that next time she wouldn't be so generous. The girls excitedly asked that she forgive them. The principal inquired that they would prefer expulsion, but Olga and Michelle certainly didn't want to be expelled, but asked why. Fran replied that curiosity was a good trait for a wizard but only if it was in moderation. So she asked the students to think about their actions. The girls looked at the principal in surprise. The girls hadn't had lunch yet, so Fran offered to keep them company and asked Louis. The guy agreed with a smile and said the more people the better. Olga and Michelle had a delicious meal. They sat and drank tea and cake. Michelle asked the teacher if she really didn't mind treating them to such an elegant lunch. The girl replied that they could consider it a lesson to help them better understand how to become a lady. And informed that she would be happy to teach those who were interested. The girls were excited. They wanted to do it again. Olga asked Louis if he would be their new teacher. Michelle replied that she couldn't wait for that. The wizard answered them that he was waiting for that too. The girls looked at each other and confessed that they had misunderstood Francisca because they had no idea that Francisca Sensei was such a wonderful and friendly person. Olga apologized for their lack of attention during her lectures. Olga and Michelle shouted that they wanted to become excellent mage knights, so they asked for permission to ask many questions during the lectures. 
Francisca was surprised and with a raised voice asked the students to be quieter. Louis was in his room and Fran knocked on his door and asked permission to come in. She came in and told him with a smile that she would like to tweak her schedule with him for this semester, starting tomorrow. The wizard happily agreed, for pointing to the huge stack of books on the table, he said that he had read all the textbooks yesterday and memorized them. The girl was shocked that he had memorized them in one night. Louis said that their contents were slightly different from what his grandfather had taught him, but they were all interesting, and he would likely be able to use all the magic described in these books. Fran sat down on the chair next to the door and lowered her head and said it wasn't fair. The guy looked at her questioningly. The girl looked at him with a smile and admitted that she had a lot of fun today. It was the first time she was able to have a normal conversation with her students. She was very pleased that they were making requests of her as a teacher. The blonde did a lot of things by herself, but the girl wanted to do more things with her students. Francisca, blushing a little, told him that for their sake she wanted to try her best. Even though she was a mage, she realized she couldn't compare to him. Louis, approaching her, said that she was wrong because he was sure that she had undiscovered potential. The girl asked in surprise why he thought that. The wizard explained that it was evident from her aura he saw that her magic power was increasing. He asked Fran not to worry about it because she would be even better in the future. Louis promised he would support her, so she just had to believe in herself. Franziska was touched by his words and hugged the wizard sharply. He asked why she was so sudden. Fran just thanked Louis and the guy accepted the hug. The girl was already asleep in her room. Louis was awake, standing in the middle of the room, said, Spiritual Reincarnation. He was flying over the outskirts of the capital city, the City of the Poor. With him was a fairy with beautiful wings and ears like an elf. They were hovering over a small house. The wizard pointing to it told her over there and asked Sylphie if she would go with him. The fairy winked at him. An important man sat at the table and asked his henchmen what they were carrying. The bandits told him that some kid had threatened Razel Barubi and he had fired them afterward. And also this Barubi rushed to the guards in fear and confessed everything. The scary and ugly man said that the royal family should not have been allowed to get to this organization. One of the bandits in a panic shouted that it was bad because they could be caught. The chief asked everyone to calm down and with a cheeky face said that they would hide until everything settled down and then promised to get even with that kid. Some brigand said that there was a rather nice girl with that brat. Another man offered to sell her into slavery because with her they could make as much money as this Barubi had never seen in his life. The boss, already tipsy from the wine, told his henchmen that as soon as they caught her, they could have fun with her first and then sell her. His six began to shout if they could get it in, and someone had a hard on. But then Louis appeared. The guy appeared in front of them and told them that they were even more disgusting than that razel. The bandit started yelling who he was and how he got here. One of the outlaws recognized him and started yelling to the boss that he was the kid. The boss, with a smug face, grabbing a wine bottle by the neck, said he couldn't believe he had gotten to them, throwing the bottle at the kid, shouting, Catch! But the bottle flew through Lewis. All the bandits were frightened, but the chief ordered them not to be afraid and to kill him. The bandits were very many, and the wizard saw in their memories images of dead girls they had defiled and sold. Louis, with a menacing face, called them scum and said they were of no use to the capital and were nothing but trouble. The bandits grinned and said those were loud words for the kid. They had already prepared their daggers, but suddenly their heads snapped off and blood whipped in different directions. The same fairy flew into the building. The heads of many bandits flew wherever they went, while the others, who had not yet suffered such a fate, looked on in horrified fear and did not understand what was happening. Lewis said Undine, and suddenly a beautiful girl made of ice appeared. Her ice shards she was pointing at the bandits. They hesitated and didn't realize what it was. But the sharp ice flakes were already pointing their ends and piercing through the vile bandits. The boss stepped back against the wall in fear and watched as his six men were horribly massacred. The wizard appeared in front of him. The main one with sniffles of fear terrified, asked who he was and demanded not to go near him, calling him a monster. Louis looked at him with an indifferent look and replied that they were selling women and they were the very ones that were the real monsters. 
The guy put his fingers at the ready and promised he would never let Fran go through something like this. Snapping his fingers, he pointed the fire at the man. He was burning alive and screaming horribly, reaching out and begging for help. The wizard looked at him and said, this was his end, pointing his hand at him. Behind his back was an undine and fairy fearfully demanding to submit and go to the very depths of the underworld. The building was a horrible mess of bandit body parts and blood everywhere. A charred boss was left sitting against the wall. Vivi, a little girl with long ponytails on her head, flew over to Louis. He asked her to take the bodies and bury them in the depths of the underworld. The blood stains too. The girl, with a satisfied face, began to carry out the order. She cleaned the room. The boy patted her on the head and said she was a good girl. Lewis turned to Undine and Sylphie and praised them too. The girls were pleased. The guy snapped his fingers and informed them that he had to be back by dawn. At breakfast, Francisca was excitedly telling her mother that Lua had memorized all the Academy's textbooks overnight. The woman was shocked that he was able to do it in one night. The girl also told her that he was now able to use all the magical techniques. Adelaide didn't expect anything else from Louis. He really did exceed all expectations. The woman asked him what subject he would teach at the academy. Louis admitted that he didn't care. Fran's mother said that the subjects to be studied were offensive magic and high-level summoning magic. She asked if he could do them. The boy agreed and said he could teach both subjects. Fran was surprised by this and asked him if he had been bad at anything. Lewis was silent, then the girl touched his arm and coming close, asked him slyly what he had been bad at. The wizard embarrassedly replied that he could use any kind of magic, but when it came to fortune telling, nothing worked. Francisca imagined him as a fortune teller and laughed out loud. The blonde cheerfully remarked that the guy wasn't good at everything after all. Her mom laughed along with her, too, but asked her daughter not to laugh so loudly while eating. Louis sat there embarrassed and silent. Adelaide cheerfully said that it was natural to have something one was bad at, but she was more amazed that Louis was versatile. Francisca fearfully pounced on the wizard and asked if it was true. The guy with a potato in his mouth replied, Fuda. The blonde yelled at him that it was serious and asked why O was silent. Adelaide asked her daughter to calm down. She reminded them that Louis still needed to hide his true power because if the royal family found out about his power, they would use him as a hero. So she asked the guy to pick one element and source it from there. The woman informed Louis that usually possessing a basic and a primary element, the wizard was to choose one of the elements. Adelaide suggested that if he had trouble deciding, she could do it for him. The guy replied that he shouldn't have because the spirits thought he could outdo anyone anyone, so he wasn't comfortable with the idea that as a practitioner he had to follow directions. Lewis would be very concerned if she decided for him. Adelaide agreed that it would indeed be very depressing, but she was very curious as to what the wizard would choose. Fran told her mother that it didn't seem to bother her. The protagonist asked to be allowed to choose his special element, and asked what element was commonly found among the teachers at the academy. Adelaide replied that water and earth were quite common. Then Louis decided to choose fire as the primary element and wind as the secondary. The woman exclaimed that they had that too. Now Adelaide wanted to talk about high-level summoning magic. The woman asked Louis to show the summoning of the spirit familiar. The guy asked if they could do it after they ate. The woman happily agreed and said they would go to the research room. They were in the research room. Francisca was very interested to see Louis's familiar. Usually the familiar's spirits were dogs, cats, or birds. Fran happily assumed that Louis's spirit would be a wolf or a lion. The wizard said that he could summon a Cerberus or a griffin, and they were different from the usual spirit familiars. Adelaide and Fran were very shocked by this. Francisca recalled in fear that the Cerberus was a magical hound that dwelt in the underworld and a huge monster eagle, and if they were summoned, the entire capital would be terrified. Louis reassured them by saying that he would not call on them. Then they asked if he could show them something else. He could, but he didn't know if they would approve. Because the creature was hated in this world, and the guy had only agreed to summon him after their approval. Francisca conceived that if he was hated, it meant he could hurt someone, so she was a little scared. 
The girl made up her mind and boldly said that she didn't mind because she trusted him. Her mother called Fran excitedly, but the girl continued that if Lewis trusted the creature, she was sure it was a good spirit. Guy thanked her and gave her word that they were in no danger. The guy with his arms outstretched forward and cast a spell. Louis was calling for the one who was called the Morning Star and leader of the Apostles, the one who lived in the depths of the underworld and could perform divine miracles, the one who could grant divine protection and create God's creations. Adelaide was wary. And then the wizard ordered the gates of the underworld to open, and Mararu appeared in front of them, a girl in a strange outfit. She introduced herself and said that she was Louis' servant and was the one who could travel between this world and the underworld. Moraru asked Louis-sama if he had called her. Adelaide and Fran looked at her in surprise. Louis told Moraru that they were his friends, Franziska and Adelaide. The girl cheerfully said that Louis-sama's friends were her friends too, but still licked. They seemed like very tasty sources of magical energy to her, Adelaide. But more than Francis was frightened, Louis covered them with himself and seriously asked her to stop and ordered her not to touch them. The wizard turned to them and apologized for her. Adelaide eyed Louis warily. She had heard that one of the lines of his spell was forbidden. After all, it was the divine protection of a creature from the underworld called the Morning Star. The woman couldn't believe that a guy could summon such a terrifying magical creature. She now wondered who he was. Louis apologized and promised to introduce her normally now. The creature he had summoned was called Morara. She was a vampire and a bit of a succubus. Fran didn't understand how she could be both a vampire and a succubus. Louis looked at Morara and she began to explain the meaning of blood sucking. When they suck blood, they directly get magic energy from it because unlike humans, they are unable to absorb magic energy from the environment. The same was true for those turned by them. Mararu asked not to misunderstand her, for as much as she could eat them, she wasn't like normal vampires because she had a bit of succubus in her, due to which she didn't need to suck blood to get magical energy, so she wouldn't act like a normal vampire, but that didn't mean she could live without magical energy, Mararu could just absorb it in a different way. Fran didn't know which one and asked. The demon assured her it would be quicker to show her. She turned to Louis, blushing slightly, and asked him to forgive her and then threw herself into his arms. She looked at a surprised Fran. Mararu put her hand under Louis's sweater and moved closer to him, holding his face gently with her other hand. Adelaide and Franziska watched her in surprise. Fran clenched her hand into a fist at the demon's introductions. Mararu noticed this and turned to her and asked if she knew what the most delicious form of magical energy was. Lewis's sweater had slipped off one shoulder and now his chest was exposed. The demon placed her palm on his heart and replied that the energy in his heart was the most delicious. She always put her hand on Lewis's chest like this, close to his heart, and enjoyed the most delicious and nourishing magical energy. Fran was outraged. The wizard sharply intercepted Mararu's hand and sternly asked her to think about her behavior. After all, he said they were his friends. Demon was saddened and apologized to Fran because her joke had gone too far. She sadly continued that her kind didn't attack humans for their magical energy, like the lower vampires did. They could live like normal humans both day and night. She was just a loyal servant to Louis, and that was all. The wizard pulled his sweater over himself and apologized, promising to try to introduce Marara at the next opportunity. But Fran asked him to wait and walked resolutely over to the demon. She held out her hand and firmly told her that she wanted to greet Morera. The demon was surprised at her sudden insistent behavior. Louis called out to Fran, confused, but the girl told him that she trusted him, and if he trusted the demoness, then she was willing to trust her too. Francisca seriously asked her mom if she agreed. Mom was okay with it, but as long as Louis took charge, she was fine with it. Fran apologized to Mararu for being scared of her at first, but she did manage to surprise her. The girl said with a smile that she hoped they would get along. Mararu thanked Francisca in surprise. The boy later told her that Mararu's parents were human. The reasons were unknown, but there are cases of human parents having a succubus child, though the likelihood of that happening is extremely low. Eight years ago, Lewis had found a half-dead Marara while training with his grandfather. The demon had been chased out of her home village and she was forced to live in the forest. 
Francisca thought sadly that Louis had saved her, but she saw that Mararu was in love with him. But since she is the same as demons, they couldn't have a closer relationship, and for eight years, she kept it to herself. Francisca thought that when the demon had hugged Louis, it had hurt because she had been so jealous of him. But the girl was sure that it had hurt Morar even more to hold it in for so long. The wizard called out to Fran and Adelaide, bowing low and thanking them for taking Mararu in. Fran thought that even though Mararu was of the demon class, Louis just couldn't leave her, and she liked that kind side of him. It was spring, the beginning of classes. Kelly welcomed everyone and announced that on the recommendation of the vice principal and her, a new teacher would be joining them. He would be a temporary teacher for a year. Louis happily introduced himself, and although he was still new, he promised to do his best. Fran told everyone that the wizard had recently saved her life during an attack, and after consulting with the deputy director, they decided to appoint him to the position. The girl apologized for talking about personal things, but he was also her follower, so she asked the girls to greet him. The teachers approached Louis one by one and introduced themselves to him. A girl with a short haircut cheerfully approached the guy, extending her hand. Her name was Cindy Ryan, Captain Calvin Ryan's wife. Louis was already familiar with her husband, and the girl told the wizard that he liked him a lot. The guy laughed awkwardly and thanked her. The next teacher came up. Her name was Liliana Barur. She flirtatiously told the wizard that she hoped they would work together. Louis just wanted to thank her, but Adelaide accidentally pushed him from behind and the guy flew right onto Liliana's lush breasts. Everyone stood in shock, especially Francisca. Lilian embarrassedly said that it was brave of him. Louis awkwardly apologized. Fran came to the guy's rescue. She pushed him hard away from the girl and started angrily yelling what he was thinking, and she couldn't believe he would pounce on the breasts of a girl he had just met. Fran's mom and Cindy stood watching. Adelaide said it was clear that it had been an accident, Cindy calling the girl a poor thing. Liliana admitted that she didn't mind at all. Fran shouted that it wasn't about that. Francisca and Louis approached the classroom. The girl angrily called out to him and was surprised to notice that he looked like he wasn't nervous at all. But that wasn't the case. And Louis, on the contrary, was looking forward to it. After all, it would be his first lecture with Fran, so he hoped it would work out. The girl smiled at him. They entered the classroom and Fran greeted everyone loudly, but no one paid any attention to her. They were just sitting there doing their own thing. Francisca noticed sadly that no one was paying attention to her today, either. She walked over to her seat and told herself to pull herself together. After all, this was Louis's first lecture. So she called out loudly to the girls and greeted them loudly once more. While Fran was saying that spring practice was starting so they would apply their previously learned knowledge to the new semester, the girls on one desk looked at her glumly, and on the other sat Olga and Michelle looking at the teacher with delight. The other students began to whisper, one girl saying to another that Iron Mask was in a good mood today. Another replied that she was wondering what happened. Francisca informed the students that before the lecture began, the new teacher, who would be the assistant, would introduce himself to them. Louis introduced himself with a big smile and told the girls that he hoped they would get along. The girls were surprised that the new teacher referred to himself using or. I, for the masculine gender, is very inappropriate in formal situations. Another student whispered caustically that he smelled like a commoner. Fran didn't like their reaction, but she decided to start already the lecture, and there were basic breathing techniques to start with. To increase magical power and release energy smoothly, Relaxation and concentration were most important. Breathing techniques were necessary for those who studied magic. There were many variations of inhaling and exhaling, but this breathing technique was drastically different, so it could be tedious for beginners. Francisca asked her to open Magic One in her books and asked if everyone was ready. Louis opened his and looked at the students, but they didn't even look at him, still talking and whispering. He noticed that everyone was communicating very openly and didn't even open the section on breathing techniques. Only a few were taking Fran's lecture seriously. It was just Olga and Michelle. Louis approached one student who was studying something completely different, but not breathing practices. She saw the wizard approaching her and rudely asked what he wanted. The teacher calmly told her that now they were studying breathing techniques, not for perception enhancement. 
The student waved him off and said that she had already learned the breathing techniques, but Louis replied to her that it was already up to Francisca Sanse to decide, but now he wanted her to do it with everyone else. The girl seemed to agree, gave her name, her name was Oreri Bo, and asked me not to address her as Omai. Oh a rude address in informal situations, sometimes male students address female students that way. Louis agreed with a smile and offered to learn breathing techniques together. Oreri gave him a disgruntled look. The wizard heard the other three female students talking and laughing together. He approached them and reprimanded them, saying that they were disturbing the others and suggested that they leave the class if they weren't interested. The girl, with her bangs pinned upwards, looked at him blankly and continued chatting with her friends. Louis snapped his fingers, and the student suddenly lost her voice. She looked warily at the wizard. The girl was surprised that the teacher had used silence magic on her. Louis turned to her girlfriends and asked her what her name was. One of them, stammering a little excitedly, replied that her name was Lady Josephine. The teacher thanked her and turned to Josephine, asking if she had heard him. Everyone in the class turned to look at them. The wizard angrily suggested that the girl finish her pointless chatter and start learning breathing techniques with the others. Josephine got angry and took a swing at the teacher. The guy grabbed her hand and asked her not to be stupid, then touched her forehead with his index finger and applied weakening magic to her. The girl fell asleep and woke up only on the street. She was surrounded by her friends. They were glad she was finally awake. Josephine asked where she was. Her friends told her that they were on campus. Since the weather was nice, the teachers decided to do the breathing exercises outdoors, and Louis Sanse took her outside. The girl looked in the direction where Louis was sitting, surrounded by students. One of her friends asked if she was okay. The girl felt great, like she had gotten a really good night's sleep. Louis saw that she was awake and walked over to her. He apologized for using magic on her, but also said that Francisca Sensei was doing her best for them. While Fran herself was studying with Olga and Michelle, Louis asked to take her lectures seriously. The teacher smiled at her and asked her very strongly. Josephine looked at him glumly as she rose and shouted angrily, No way! and said she didn't want to hear it. The student, shaking off the guffaw, arrogantly said that if he kneeled down and apologized, she might be more attentive in lectures. Thinking to herself gloatingly that this was his punishment for being such a worthless commoner and daring to look down on a noblewoman like her, she waited shuddering with embarrassment. But Louis replied that he couldn't do that. Josephine shouted why he couldn't do that. After all, he was a commoner and asked in raised tones if he was aware that he had to do whatever the nobles said. The wizard calmly replied that he was well aware of the hierarchy in this country, but this was a school and he was a teacher her mentor, and she was a student, his student, so he didn't want to be insolent, but he advised her to watch her language. The girl was amused by the fact that he was her mentor, but Louis abruptly stepped closer to her and showed his fingers ready to snap to make her lose her voice. Josephine immediately fell silent. She said glumly that it wasn't fair. Louis smiled at her and walking away called out to her because they didn't have much time. The student asked him to wait giving him her hand, saying that if he was a gentleman, he should lead the lady. The teacher smiled at her. Still, Louis agreed to take his student. Everyone on the street was watching them in surprise. Michelle noticed that Josephine had become more obedient. Fran turned around when she saw them, smiling at Louis's efforts to build a relationship with his students. The teacher led Josephine to Francisca and asked her if the girl could join her. Fran happily agreed and said they could continue together. Louis sat down beside them and began to explain to the girls that they didn't need to get so caught up in what was said about breathing techniques in the books. After all, it was better to do what suited them best. It was more important to relax and focus because it would increase their magical power. The teacher suggested diaphragmatic breathing, single nostril breathing, thoracic breathing, quiet breathing, and asked them to try out different variations to determine which one would work best for them. He stood up and said that the whole point was to rest and asked the girls to lie down on the grass. Olga and Michelle quietly obeyed. Josephine, warily looking at the girls, thought for sure it was a training, but still lay down on the grass. Lying on the ground, she thought she was just wasting her time at the academy. She was going to attend until her parents chose a fiancé for her. 
She had never taken lectures seriously before, but she still followed the advice to relax and breathe deeply. A fairy appeared in Josephine and poked her cheek with her finger. The girl opened her eyes to see who it was. She didn't understand, but it felt good. It felt like a gentle wind was enveloping her. Josephine was lying still on the grass. Fran worriedly suggested Louis wake her up because the lecture was about to end. But the guy asked for a little more because he was sure she was synchronizing with her spirit. Francisca was surprised. After all, spirits would take an interest in a compatible person and bond with them and then unite. She didn't think Josephine was strong enough now to make a connection with her spirit. But it was a good start. Louis promised he would bring her back later and Fran could take the others back in the meantime. The girl agreed. She was cheerfully called out by her students. One happily reported that she had been able to master the breathing techniques, and another admitted that the lecture had been a lot of fun. Fran asked if they were really having fun. The girls shouted happily that they were and asked why they hadn't done it before. The girl turned to Louis in surprise and looked at him. The students were very animated, for she had never had such an intense lecture. Francisca looked happily at Louis and thought that getting him to teach at the academy was definitely the right decision. The boy from school was being watched by Kelly. Kelturi was sitting in her office. Louis knocked on her door. The deputy director invited him in. She got up from her seat and apologized for calling him in so suddenly. The boy replied that it was fine and asked what was wrong. Kelly said thoughtfully that it had been a long time since they had seen each other and invited them to sit down and she would pour them some tea. Kelturi noticed that his first lecture had gone well and he was now quite popular with the students. Louis was happy about that and he started to smirk. The pixie asked why he wouldn't stop smirking. The guy cheerfully said that it looked like she was doing well because he was worried after she disappeared from Sato. The woman was surprised, putting her cup on a plate. She confessed that a lot had happened and rumors had reached her that Sylvester Sama had recently died. Louis replied that that was the reason he had left Sato. The wizard revealed that Leo had succeeded her grandfather. He was sure she would make an excellent soul. Kelly stared at the boy and said that as far as she knew before Sylvester Sama died, he had appointed him as the successor. The Elfess asked him why he refused. Louis looked at her and looked away. Kelturi remembered how Sowell had brought him to them. He found him in the forest. Among the elves it was said that the boy had lost his memory and wandered there. To them, he was a strange child. They didn't understand what Sowell was thinking when he brought the stranger to them. They were to train the man that Sylvester Sama had suddenly brought to their home and who would become the next Sowell. Sylvester brought him to meet Kelly. When they shook hands, the kid looked at her in surprise and then smiled the cutest smile. The girl looked at him confused and wary. Elves were known for their disdainful attitude towards outsiders. They constantly mocked him, but he never minded it and always smiled at them. Sylvester Sama was constantly giving him new assignments, and this man showed how extraordinary he was. In the summer, three years after Lewis's appearance, the apparition of spirits began, an event during which students received protection from the spirits. It was a fateful day for the mages. Louis stood in a large circle among the elves. They mocked him and said that a man would never get the protection of the spirits in his life. But that day Sylvester Sama foretold that this child would gain the protection of all spirits and an incredible magician would be born. All the elements appeared to Louis, water, undine, wind, sylphy, earth, vivi, and fire, salamander. They joyfully surrounded him. Sylvester Sama began to show more and more interest in Louis, for Louis had become an all-rounder. Being a high-class mage, Kelly was rated accordingly, but many people stopped training after seeing Louis's godlike power. Kelturi knew he would be the next soul, so she left Sato to study magic among humans. Louis told the Elfess that a feud had begun. Many were against the man becoming the next soul. A little more and it would come to the point of using force. And he didn't want that, because he had started a pointless conflict among the elves. Kelly looked at him sympathetically and gave him a hard slap. Louis, clutching his head, looked at Kelturi in bewilderment. The Elfess called him a fool and told him not to make such a face. After all, it wasn't his fault. She admitted to him that it was so like him. There really was no greed in him. Kelly asked why he had become a follower of that crazy princess. Louis laughed and said it was an accident. 
because he really wanted to protect Fran. The elf looked at him in surprise. Suddenly the guy remembered that it was already time to go because Fran was waiting for him, running away. He waved his hand and apologized because it was already time for him to go to Fran. And before he left, he thanked Kelly. Her tea was delicious. Kelly looked at him strangely, grabbing her bow on her chest, and was surprised that the guy wanted to protect Fran. Francisca knew that Louis was at the vice principal's office. The guy was glad they could have a leisurely talk. The girl frowned at him and thought he had it written all over his face. Olga and Michelle walked in front of them. Fran wondered why they were going to the arena. The wizard asked Fran who was walking ahead of the girls. The girl told him that Giselle Calpanti was a third year, as well as the president of the student council, and a very gifted girl, and was also the head of the magical arts, which Michelle and Olga were members of. But it was strange for Fran because it was a bit early for club activities, and also Michelle and Olga seemed very upset with her. She admitted to the wizard that she was a bit worried and offered to follow them. The guy agreed to go with her. Louis and Fran followed the girls, but Giselle already knew that Francisca was following them without turning to ask her what she needed. The girl frowned, thinking that she had spotted her before she had even uttered a word. Olga and Michelle turned to her in a daze. Fran asked Giselle what she was going to do with the girls, but the girl replied that it was none of the academy's business. Fran awkwardly said that the students were from her class, so it was her business. Giselle turned sharply to Francisca and said angrily that she didn't care about her class. After all, she always ignored her students. Fran had nothing to say. She stood there confused. Giselle continued to harass the principal, saying that these girls were her students, and they had known the same pain as she had, so she didn't want to be taught by such an irresponsible teacher. Francisca lowered her head sadly. Giselle said that the girls had been acting strangely since the morning, and when she asked, they confessed to her that the other day they had been following someone out of curiosity and that such behavior was unacceptable. Giselle smugly continued that she was training their bodies and minds. She believed she was doing Fran's job for her and advised her to say thank you and also reflect on her irresponsible behavior. Suddenly Louis was behind Giselle and informed the brash girl that they had already taken care of the problem. The blonde bounced away from him frightened and screamed who he was and when he had snuck up on her. The guy cheerfully introduced himself and said he was the teaching assistant of the two girls and a follower of Francisca. Giselle realized it was that new teacher. She saw him as a goofball. The girl wondered how such a fool was able to sneak up on her. And also, this commoner had the audacity to address her in, Oh my. Louis told her that Olga and Michelle had been following them and they had already realized their mistake and apologized. Giselle shouted that it didn't mean anything and she as senpai should guide them. The wizard looked at her strangely. The girl interrupted and asked where he was looking. Louis replied that there was no need and it looked like she just wanted to find out something about the others. Giselle opened her mouth in shock. The girls asked in surprise what Giselle wanted to talk about. The girl called the guy a bastard, said he was just a commoner and asked him if he knew what would happen to him if he insulted her. She yelled at him and demanded that he fight her for insulting Kalpati's name and promised to cut him in half. Francisca was surprised and frightened at Giselle's suggestion. The girl meanwhile thought smugly that to fight this commoner and make him apologize, she would not rest until she had made him apologize on his knees. Louis replied that she had insulted Francisca, and because she cared for her students, as a teacher, as her follower, he could not turn a blind eye. And as Lady Francisca's representative, Louis was ready to fight Giselle. Everyone was shocked. Fran rushed to separate them and asked if they were serious. The guy replied that he was serious and asked Giselle. The girl was also in agreement. After all, in Valentine, she would be recognized as a fearless warrior. So naturally, she would be serious. Franziska called Louis and Giselle over and said that as headmistress she could not allow them to risk their lives. Then Giselle frantically asked what they should do. Fran suggested they use the hunting forest. They needed to hunt monsters and determine who would destroy more and higher level monsters, and she promised not to interfere and asked how they liked that option. Giselle was visibly frightened. After all, the hunting forest was an area on the outskirts of the capital where the boys and girls from the night school practiced magic fighting students trained. 
Francisca warned them that they had to get permission first. Giselle hastily agreed and angrily told them that they had to promise that the loser would do whatever the winner said. She walked away from them menacingly. Olga and Michelle sadly called out to Fran and in tears apologized to her, for it was their fault. The girl turned to them and hugged them, saying that it wasn't, for it was her fault for not paying enough attention to them. She was sorry. The girls looked at each other in surprise. Louis promised that everything would be fine. After all, they could just rely on him. Giselle came into the dormitory in a frenzy and called Nadia loudly, saying she had a request, asking her to listen. A girl named Nadia was sitting on the windowsill in the dorm room and asked what had happened so badly that the girl barged in on her without knocking. Giselle shouted angrily that she had never been so insulted in her life. Nadia got up from the windowsill and asked her friend to calm down and just tell her what had happened. The girl told everything. Nadia understood and asked her what she wanted her to do to help her in the hunting forest. That was what Giselle wanted from her and apologized for asking it so suddenly, for she had only counted on her, bowing her head and promising to be grateful. Nadia said with a wink that they were friends. Giselle was touched by her words and pounced on her with hugs and thanks. Nadia laughed and hugged her friend back, slyly saying that she had nothing to worry about because she would always and everywhere be by her side. It was the day of the duel. The girls were riding in a carriage, and Giselle was asking her friend what she was up to. After all, she had announced their duel to everyone and even allowed spectators to be present. Giselle wanted to forbid the presence of spectators because it was a private duel. Nadia explained that it was to let as many people as possible know about their victory. But Giselle didn't want to show off. Then her friend told her that would not do. After all, they had to show everyone their strength. Their opponent was Principal Francisca, and the observer would be Chairman Adelaide. By defeating the chairman's daughter, they would assert their superiority. Giselle looked as if she had just now had an epiphany, thinking that if they won this fight, the powerful Dumel family would be weakened while the Calpanti and Nadia Sharlova families would become powerful. She was fine with that. She was thrilled that her friend had thought everything through so far in advance. Nadia looked at her determinedly and said that they would definitely win. Louis and Fran were standing in front of the gate to the hunting forest. Kelly walked up behind the guy and stabbed him in the back. Louis arched slightly in surprise and turned to her. Kelturi frowned. He had just gotten settled into the academy and already he was in so much trouble. Kelly was Giselle and Nadia's third-year Class A teacher, so she would be an observer on their side. A carriage pulled up, and Giselle and Nadia got out of it. Nadia, seeing Louis, went up to him and told him that she was the vice president of the student council. She disrespectfully said that she could see he hadn't run away, even though it was already obvious to her who was going to win. The wizard glared at her and asked her sternly if she was aware that such an impertinent tone was inappropriate. The girl called him an insolent commoner and asked him to think more carefully about how to address her. Louis only agreed if she won. He used Omai oh again, which Nadia was not happy about and said that he might be the assistant principal, but if he lost, he would have to apologize on his knees, licking her shoes. Francisca wanted to intervene, but Louis blocked her way with his hand, said it was all right, and asked her to rely on him. The girl looked at him worriedly. In front of the gate stood the head of the hunting forest. Ebel. In his hands, he had a bracelet, which will be worn by the participants to give them points based on the strength of the defeated monster. When the monster is defeated, the bracelet will record it. The team with more points will win. These hunting grounds include plains, sandy lands, swamps, villages, and ancient runes. The monsters had a weakening spell cast on them, but they were still dangerous. Also, the bracelets have magic built in to indicate the location of the monsters. The competition is scheduled to begin at noon and last three hours. The spectators also want to make sure that the participants were not threatened, and the superintendent asked everyone to remember that cheating was forbidden in any form. Giselle and Nadia's team moved out. Louis turned to Fran and said they had to go too. Francisca was in agreement. They walked through the woods and Fran remembered the night before the competition. Francisca was showing Lua her new robe. The wizard said it suited her well. The girl giggled and thanked him. The boy thoughtfully asked to take it off. Fran asked right away to take it off for her. Louis said yes firmly. Louis turned away, 
and while he waited for the girl to take off her robe, was thinking about something. Francisca was confused as to what he was doing, but if it was with Louis, she was okay with it. Fran took off her robe and underneath, she found herself in just her underwear. Francisca embarrassedly announced that she had taken it off. Louis took the robe and began to look at it and said he thought it lacked protective effects. The girl sat with her knees pulled up to her chest, disappointed to think that Louis was interested in the robe. The boy turned to her and asked if he could cast a simple, enhancing spell. He wanted to increase her defenses. Fran was sitting in front of him in her underwear, and Louis only now noticed it. He quickly turned away and said, embarrassed that she was in her underwear under the gown. He apparently hadn't thought of that. Francisca nervously apologized and asked what he didn't like. The guy shyly replied that it was beautiful, apologized and said he understood she was cold, but asked her to bear with it for a while. Francisca, remembering this in the forest, was embarrassed, for she was practically naked in front of Louis. But the girl was happy to note that she could feel Louis's kindness emanating from that robe. It felt good. Fran asked the wizard where they would go first. The guy suggested looking around. He closed his eyes and used magic to detect the enemy. Louis said that Giselle's team was now in an ancient ruin that was full of orcs. There should be a group of ten orcs about 300 meters away. He informed them that he would go bait them and they should wait for him here. Orcs were monsters with a constant thirst for destruction, acted instinctively, liked to defile women and eat human flesh. Louis beheaded several orcs and asked the main one if he was the leader of the group. The leader of the group was a high-level orc, also known as an orc commander. The crowd of orcs shrieked and pounced on the wizard, but the guy was quick to deal with them and they fell to the ground one by one. Louis, having waited until the orc commander was alone, jumped down from a tree and said he couldn't bait everyone while he was alive, so he needed to kill him, and he ripped his head off. Fran was waiting for the wizard. He was already running and he was being chased by a mob of orcs with clubs. As soon as they got to the right place, the guy shouted to Francisca to use that magic of hers. The girl took out a sharp needle from her sleeve, put her hands forward, and cast a spell, using the magic flaming projectile. She succeeded, and one more attack should have been enough, but then Louis fell from the tree onto the remaining orc. He ripped his head off sharply, landing on the ground, praised Francisca, wiping the blood from his face, said that she did leave one behind, and he had to deal with it, so he asked for more effort next time, Fran promised confidently. Kelly, who was watching them with her head down, admitted that the contest was very ridiculous. The girl didn't understand her, so the elf decided to explain that Louis would be the next Sowl, so these orcs were nothing to him. Francisca didn't know that he would be the next soul. Kelturi Riley said that she didn't know that, even though it was about someone she loved. Fran was discouraged by the statement, and yelled that when she wasn't around, Louis acted differently. Kelly advised the principal to take back what she said, calling her by her nickname, Iron Mask. Fran got completely pissed off and demanded that she explain herself. Kelly snidely said that the students had nicknamed her that. Lewis called out to the girls and said they were moving out. There was still no way the Elfess was going to get away with it, and accused Fran of not understanding at all who Sowell was, and most likely thinking he was the elf leader, and nothing more. But Francisca excitedly shouted that she thought Sowell was a powerful mage. That was the problem for Kelturi. She just described him with a hackneyed phrase, all the details she couldn't give. But she decided to try and enlighten Fran a bit. The history of the elves dates back to the age of the gods. It was said that God, who created the universe and created the apostles and spirits, endowed them with wisdom and power. And since humans had just come to this world, they had no experience. The godlike descendants of the tribe of northern fairies became the nation of elves. They had the ability to communicate with many apostles and spirits. The elves gained unique knowledge from the age of gods, and this knowledge manifested itself in different ways. Kelly asked Fran if she told her that it was the story of the elves, how she would react. Fran wondered excitedly if it meant that Louis also had accumulated knowledge and power from the age of the gods. She replied that she found it hard to believe that they were related to apostles and spirits. Kelturi said that it was true, for that meant that Louis, being human, would have unlimited power and would have to be Sowell. Louis turned to them and replied that even if it wasn't him, Liu, Kelly's older sister, 
would do quite well. At the same time, Giselle and Nadia were fighting the ogres in the ancient ruins. Ogres, like orcs, like to devour human flesh, were ruthless and extremely dangerous, possessing tremendous strength, ten times that of humans and much taller than humans. Giselle swung at them and chopped them in half. Nadia praised her. And since the ogres were given the most points, it was a good idea to start with them. Nadia reported that she had done a little research on the new area they were wandering around in. Giselle said cheerfully that she knew her friend could be counted on. Nadia cheerfully suggested to continue following the kick enemy asses plan. Giselle pulling out her sword to clarify that she was acting as a shield and Nadia was destroying them with magic. Nadia confirmed that it was exactly like that. Giselle went to execute the plan and Nadia, slyly escorting her friend with a look, thought that it was very easy for her in the vanguard. She didn't want the chairwoman to see that she was inferior to Giselle in physical strength or swordsmanship, because if she messed up, they could be in danger. When it came to close combat, only Giselle could prove herself very well, and Nadia thought sadly that she didn't even notice how she had become a second plan. After all, socially her friend had always been better than her, and in her studies too. And because of Giselle, the girl felt humiliated, while Nadia wanted to become the number one of the Magic Academy and she thought the competition was a chance to show herself. Nadia has prepared a trap for Giselle's battle-hungry heart magic, suppressing fear and unleashing her most hidden instincts. The girl decided to use her friend as a pawn, and when it's all over, she'll be the only one who can accomplish anything, and she won't care if she falls because she'll happily become the next student council president. Nadia yelled for Giselle to let her stretch too. Her friend agreed and called the ogres towards Nadia. The girl, crossing her arms above her head, thought that Giselle had already defeated the ogres enough, so she used her hurricane magic. Giselle was ecstatic, her friends spreading her arms out to the sides, promising that victory was now in their pocket, and asking the chairwoman how she felt about her performance and if she had realized their power. Adelaide admitted that it was quite interesting, but asked Nadia to remember to tell her about the wind magic later. The girls looked at her perplexed, the woman asked them to continue because the competition was not over yet. Adelaide noticed that the magic Nadia was using was not taught at the academy, and it was not spiritual magic. The woman got a bad feeling. She also noticed that Giselle used to act more mature and often got angry, but now she acted like Nadia was her mother, like she relied on her completely. Although Adelaide thought her daughter was behaving similarly, one could not say that about others. Nadia suddenly fell senseless in front of Giselle, her friend ran up to her, frightened, and called out to her. Adelaide looked around and saw that there was no sign of magic being used on her, and no monsters were nearby either. She didn't understand what had happened then, but either way, they needed to be moved to safety. But suddenly the woman had a terrible voice in her head, belonging to some dangerous creature, telling her that it could see her and her real name, so it would serve her. At this time, Louis felt it too. He crouched down, Wondering what that burst of magical energy was, Fran called out loudly to the wizard and reported that the ogres had spotted them and were now closing in on them. Louis, rising, said he would go himself. The wizard told the girl that he had a bad feeling about it, so he needed to finish it quickly. Fran was perplexed, but the boy had already jumped into the air to the ogres. The guy landed and told the monsters he was the one they were looking for. The ogre king a high-level ogre, much larger than the unusual ogres and possessed unrivaled strength, pounced on Louis. The ogre swung his huge arm at the boy with all his might. Francisca called out to Louis in a panic, but the wizard deflected his blow with his small hand and said that if he relied on strength alone, he had no chance of winning. He then punched him in the stomach and made a huge hole in it. The other ogres stood in shock, and Louis turned to them and said he didn't have much time, so he promised to kill them quickly and painlessly. Louis used the explosive fire blade magic. Fran was amazed. Kelly with a frown thought the guy was able to use several types of magic and still combined spirit magic within a few seconds. Fran ran to Louis and yelled if he was okay, he was fine. Then the girl asked what bad feeling he had. The guy replied that he felt something ominous. He could feel Adelaide's and the other's magical energy fading, so he had to hurry. Vivi appeared behind Louis, Fran asked who it was in surprise. The wizard explained that it was Vivi, the Earth Spirit. 
He said that they were running out of time, so he was using Vivi's power and transference magic to get through the spirit world and get to Adelaide and the others faster. Francisca was surprised that he was capable of such a thing as well. Louis explained that Vivi would temporarily manipulate their bodies to guide them through the spirit world and get them where they needed to go. Fran and Louis hugged and the guy called out to Kelly and said they would meet later and asked Francisca to hold on tight. Kelturi stood dumbfounded and afterwards hugged the guy from behind and asked him to take her with him. The girl wasn't going to let them go and had to be taken. Fran wasn't happy about it. Vivi appeared above them and Louis urged her to act. A black hole appeared below them and the guys fell through it. Fran was mesmerized by the place Vivi was taking them through. The spirit world was beautiful, and if it wasn't for this situation, Francisca would have been mesmerized by the view. They arrived at the place, Louis thanked the spirit, and allowed them to go back. Francisca clearly felt an eerie and heavy magical wave. Kelly suddenly screamed Nadia was standing there. The girl stood with her back to them and turning her head slightly, asked with a sly smile, Nadia? She turned fully towards them and announced that this body was now a vessel. Kelly was shocked and wanted to approach, but Louis blocked her way with his hand. He already knew it was a demon that had consumed Nadia. The demon mockingly said he saw right through her. Nadia's negative emotions called to her, calling him a boy. The demon admitted he had quite interesting magical energy, but he was human and she wanted his body. Louis saw that the creature was too dangerous, so he thought he needed to make sure Fran stayed behind because he could hit them if he wasn't careful. Nadia, squinting her eyes slyly, said he wanted to protect them, but he wouldn't succeed and pointed her hands at them. The guy perked up and ordered the girls to stay behind him. But the creature in Nadi was the lord of the underworld, the demon vain, and now that her true name had been revealed, they would become her loyal servants. The girls stared at her in horror, then slumped senseless. Lewis looked angrily at the demon. Vine told him that he had the power to read people like an open book. Usually a name is just a symbol. Humans and succubi had true names given to them by their creator, and true names were the soul. In other words, knowing the true name was like mastering the soul. Vine said the guy was next to become his servant. But Lewis replied that he had to refuse. Then the demon smugly said that humans couldn't resist his power, and now he was going to read his true name. The demon directed his magic at Louis, but it reflected off the guy. Then Vine stared at him perplexed because he couldn't read him. Louis smiled smugly and asked if he was going to show his special technique. A pattern of symbols appeared over Louis's eye. He continued to scoff that the demon wanted to show him his special technique that revealed true names. Vine suddenly noticed that he couldn't move. The wizard told that he was already under the effect of his magic containment. He was not happy that he used the girl as a vessel and asked to leave the body of his dear student. But the demon, calling the guy a fool, revealed the secret that he could move from this body to anywhere, could even use those lying, unconscious girls behind him. Louis looked at her and said that demons were indeed treacherous and wicked, and asked why. After all, he thought they were noble creatures. A more horrifying voice was heard in Vine's mind. It was Lucifer behind Louis's back, saying that they were supposed to lead people and were even willing to fall from heaven for this fight. And where had that noble desire gone? Vine was terrified and couldn't believe that voice was coming from this boy. Louis walked over to Nadia and grabbed her chin and asked her where the girls that were with her were, because if anything happened to them, he would have to rip his soul to shreds. He promised that even a demon like him could not be reborn because his pitiful remains would forever remain in oblivion. The demon did not wait for that moment and flew out of the girl's body. Louis noticed that he had escaped into the ancient ruins with an unconscious Nadia in his arms. Lucifer, who was standing behind him, turned to Louis and said that it seemed that they had frightened this demon because he had escaped. But the boy replied with a smile that thanks to him, they had recovered Nadia's body. The guy grabbing Fran explained that it would take some time to heal Nadia, so he decided to start with Fran and Kelly and asked Lucifer if he could help him. The demon agreed because the girls could have one foot in the grave. There was only one way to free the bodies of those whose true names given by their creator had been stolen. It was necessary to change their true names with his spell, but Lucifer needed their consent. 
Louis said he would use magic to do this and summon their souls. The wizard entered the girl's mind. She wandered in the void and looked for Louis. The guy answered her that everything was fine and asked her not to worry about anything and just trust him. Fran agreed. Louis warned that her soul would be able to feel the waves of his magical energy she had to believe and not get lost. Francisca heard another voice. He said he was going to change the true name given to her by her creator, but it was against the laws of this world. Lucifer asked the girl if she had the resolve to face the taboo. Francisca was surprised to realize that it wasn't Louis anymore, but the energy was gentle. Like there were two Louis and Fran realized there was another Louis there. So she boldly agreed and begged to be escorted out. Lucifer noted that the girl had already noticed his connection to Louis and promised that he would grant his wish. Fran woke up, overleaned Mararu with a finger near her lips. She asked her to be quiet because the master was concentrating. Francisca saw Louis leaning over Kelly and applying magic. Mararu explained that he had saved her as well. Kelturi woke up. The guy greeted her with a happy smile. Kelly was moved, crying, and pounced on Louis with a hug. Fran and Mararu looked at them. The succubus vampire explained that it was normal after all. She had almost died, and so had Fran. Louis turned to Morar and said he was leaving the girls to her. The demon promised to protect them at the cost of her own life. Francisca thought sadly that she wanted to go with Louis too, but she feared she would only slow him down. The wizard turned to her and told her to relax, for he was sure to save Giselle and Adelaide. Fran asked him to be careful. The guy, snapping out of his seat, replied that she could count on him. In the ancient ruins, Vine was nervous. He couldn't believe he had heard Lucifer. After all, he must be imprisoned in the depths of the spirit world. He figured it was an illusion created by that boy. Louis called out loudly to the demon and demanded to fight him and then bring back Giselle and Adelaide. The demon turned to him and called him a lowly human being. Vine took on his true appearance. The build was that of a sturdy and strong knight. Instead of a lion's head, he sat on a beautiful horse, clad in armor. The demon told him to know his place. Vine, calling him a fool, promised that this time it would end differently, launching a magical wave at Lua, shouting that he wouldn't fall for his trick again. The guy smiled and jumped back from the demon's magic. He also launched a wave at him, screaming that he wouldn't leave. Louis, bouncing back from the blow, thought that was water and wind magic, and the next one would be a combination of the two. Lionhead laughed and asked what was wrong, if he was done pretending because only Lucifer was an honorable creature and he recognized him as his lord, so the demon wasn't willing to let such a man imitate him. Vine launched another wave directly at Louis. After everything dispersed, he saw wings that were floating in the air. He didn't realize what it was and was surprised that his magic didn't work. But then, Louis appeared from behind the wings. He shockingly counted the wings. There were twelve of them. Lord Lucifer was standing in front of him. The guy had strictly ordered the return of the hostages, and now it was his turn to use magic. They were perfect wings. These wings were a symbol of absolute protection, and none of the other apostles were able to control them. They were undoubtedly Lucifer's wings. Vine, looking at them, recognized that it was beautiful. Archangel Lucifer, before he was the most faithful apostle of the creator and leader of all the Durga apostles, the Honorable Lucifer had many such titles, such as Morning Star, and radiating light. Once, when the venerable Lucifer was reporting on something to their Lord, the Creator, he did not accept his report and then punished the Apostle Lucifer by giving him the title Arrogant. The Honorable Lucifer could not accept such unreasonable punishment, so he decided to fight it, leading apostles like Vine. Eventually, they were defeated. The Creator's anger for his rebellion was very strong. Then he gave a single order to the new Archangel to banish the rebellious Lucifer to the very depths of the underworld. Vine still remembered it very clearly, remembered how he had looked when he had fallen straight from heaven into the depths of the underworld. And the sturdy, immortal body and pure soul of the honorable Lucifer had been encased in the bowels of the Kosit, Jubeka. He was far from arrogance. He was guided by the weakest people who were created from pieces of earth and gave them a strong will to live. He taught them to make their own decisions and follow their destiny. But when he did, the Creator made people see it as a burden, and Lucifer became an object of fear, 
which is why people despised him and said he was an entity under the deepest ban. But suddenly the Honorable Lucifer reincarnated and became the ruler of the land of men. It was unclear if it was the choice of the Taurus or someone else's doing, but he was reborn as the wizard king Louis Serion. They demons, who were known as the Seventy-Two Pillars, were also sent to the underworld, lost their will, and their unity was broken. However, Venerable Lucifer brought them back together again, and they set their sights on innovating humans. They served under him again and their happiness was restored. However, Louis Serion's body was just a human body. Days went by and eventually he died during his ambition, and they seventy-two pillars were divided. They went their separate ways and started doing what they wanted to do. And now that Vane thought about it, his awakening was a miracle. He never thought he would be reborn as a human. The demon didn't know why Lewis had wings like their honorable Lucifer, but he was human. He must have a fragile body he could cut through. Louis snapped his fingers and they found themselves in a bright place. The demon, looking around excitedly, asked where they were. Louis told him that he had sent him to an alternate space that had been created by him. And now they could fight as much as their souls desired. For he also wanted to crush Vine's body, his soul, and erase his entire existence. But the demon at this thrust his weapon forward and shouted angrily for him not to make him laugh. Vine used the high-pressure water wall magic, but it was useless. Louis just froze his wall. The powerful aura prevented it from striking the man. Louis cast the spell, Kosite, and many shards struck the demon's body. Vine already thought he would disappear forever, and before the end saw the Honorable Lucifer. Vine came to his senses and asked why he was still alive. Louis replied that he had let him survive, but that was only because he hadn't raised his hand on the hostages. But the Lucifer inside of Louis didn't agree with his decision. Vine jumped at the voice of his honorable master, but Lucifer explained that his body and soul were still trapped in Judeca. He was using his only apostle, Louis, to see the world. Since Lucifer was now talking to the demon through telepathic magic, in fact using Louis's soul to do so, the guy reached out to him and offered to work under his wing. Vine was surprised by this and turned away. The wizard kept insisting that if he agreed to contract with him, he could work under Lucifer's wing, for he could restore his loyal will that had been broken. And from then on, Louis promised Vine to walk beside Lucifer again and asked the overlord what he thought about it. Lucifer replied a little irritated that he could do what he wanted. Louis held out his hand to him, but immediately Lucifer appeared in front of the demon and beckoned him with a smile. Vine's tears flowed, and he accepted his hand and promised to serve him forever. Adelaide came to her senses and saw Louis. The guy turned around to look at her. The woman sat closer to him and saw that Giselle was refusing his help. The guy was doing the same thing he was doing to the others, but there was no way the girl was waking up. Louis realized that unlike her and Fran, Giselle didn't trust him enough. That was kind of a given 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 what had happened earlier. But now her life was on the line. The guy informed her that they had to hurry because Nadia was hurt too. Adelaide thought sadly that she couldn't believe that all this had happened while she was unconscious. She asked Louis what she could do to help. The guy said she had just come back from death's doorstep, so he didn't think she should have pushed herself. But Adelaide said resolutely that it was okay, after all. It was to save her precious student, so it was worth risking her life. Louis looked at her in surprise and admitted that he always thought his grandfather was the best teacher. But she was amazing too. And asked the question for the teachers, were the students worth risking their lives, grinning? But Louis didn't want her to overwork herself, for if anything happened to her, Fran would be very saddened. So he warned that he would take spirit form and enter Giselle's spirit world. So he asked Adelaide if she could watch over her with the Cerberus while he did it. The woman was afraid of the Cerberus. Louis summoned it, and an animal with three wolf heads and several snakes appeared. It roared threateningly. The woman screamed. Louis asked the Cerberus to protect Adelaide. The monster and the woman looked at each other. Adelaide suddenly said what a marvelous animal it was and went up to examine it more closely. Louis, watching them, thought that people were usually afraid of him, but that was to be expected of Adelaide. Louis said he would ask the Cerberus to shrink in size, but the woman didn't mind leaving him as he was now. Still, the monster took the form of a dog and sat beside Adelaide. Louis began to perform magic on Giselle. 
he found himself in the desert. A person's spiritual world reflected their state of mind. Vine was the reason Giselle's world now looked sluggish. The boy heard her thoughts, she thought. She would surely become a magical knight under the name of a respected Kalpanite family. Then her father, whom she respected, would introduce her to a socially appropriate partner, and she would become a diligent wife. But the girl doubted that this was normal. After all, it was a stereotypical life for a noblewoman's daughter. She saw her future directly and wondered if it was really normal for her to live a life where she wouldn't be able to challenge herself. It was clear to the guy Giselle's heart was wavering over her future. And then Nadia, charmed by Vine, took advantage of their friendship. And he also made Nadia a bad influence on Giselle. Giselle sat with her legs pressed to her chest. Louis called out to her. The girl turned to him glumly and told him he was very pushy. She couldn't believe he had come all the way here, because she wasn't going to leave this place no matter how much he begged her to, because no one could stop her here. She was free here. Louis apologized to her. Giselle turned to him abruptly and asked what he said. The wizard replied saying sorry, because he was sorry for penetrating so deeply into her thoughts. He really had gone too far. The girl turned away from him and shouted what he was talking about. But Lewis interrupted her and said that she wanted to know more about Miss Cindy. She was a former magical swordsman and she was praised more than she was. So Giselle looked down on her and needed her advice on many things. However, the girl's pride and ego got in her way. It was the truth that lurked in her heart. And she also wanted her friends to know the truth. Giselle was unwilling to accept that was the truth and screamed that everything Lewis had said was a lie. The guy replied that she could say it was a lie, but they had to choose from here, because then she would die if she stayed here for long. The girl was some very stupid and annoying. She started arrogantly talking nonsense and telling her not to laugh because you see she felt comfortable here. Lewis seriously replied to her that she was wrong, because the longer she stayed here, the more her mind and body would deteriorate. Giselle covered her ears in fright and screamed for him to stop lying because he was deceiving her. The wizard crouched down beside her, calling her over, explaining that even though it was inevitable, he felt responsible as a teacher for following her all the way here. So if he didn't save her, he didn't mind dying with her. Giselle looked at him with tears in her eyes and saw that he was telling the truth. Louis continued that if the girl believed him, he promised that she wouldn't die and he would definitely save Nadia. Giselle exclaimed in shock that Nadia's life was also in danger. Louis looked at her intently and then the girl agreed to go with him. After all, it was necessary to hurry to save Nadia too. The wizard thanked her. Louis, getting up, asked if she could get up. Giselle only replied that she could get up, but she screamed and sprawled on the ground. She had no strength at all. The guy questioned in surprise. The girl screamed why this was happening. Then the guy put his hand in hers and asked her to take it, but silly Giselle refused his help. Then Louis apologized and said they didn't have time. So after apologizing again, took the girl in his arms. Giselle was angry. He was holding her like a princess. In her opinion, she was being held in his arms by the enemy. She really hated the man, but still she was embarrassed. Franziska, Morar, and Kelly were joined by Adelaide, Louis, and a weakened Giselle. They were relieved that they were all alive, but Kelturi worriedly informed Louis that Nadia still hadn't woken up. Louis rushed to her and promised to save her now, but he was overtaken by Giselle. She jumped up to her friend and started shouting apologies for being so useless, for if she had paid more attention, a hand lay on the girl's shoulder. It was Francisca. She promised with a smile that Nadia would be fine so she could take it easy and suggested leaving the rest to Louis. He had saved everyone else after all. Giselle sadly agreed. They stayed back to watch Louis. The guy examining Nadia noticed that she had the most serious injuries, so he would have to delve deep into her soul. Louis began to delve into her soul. This man had immense magical power. Adelaide's skin was all tingly. She told me that she felt as if he was entering an even more dangerous realm than when he had done this for them. Giselle asked her if it was really dangerous. Kelly replied that it was very dangerous because he was getting into their souls without knowing the way out. Adelaide said that she had read about it in books. But this process required starting from hell itself to seek out fallen souls. Their salvation required great effort, and Louis risked his life for the sake of all of them. 
Giselle was scared and excited. The girl didn't understand why he would risk himself like that. After all, he was a commoner who had recently come to the academy and they were all just strangers to him. She kept wondering why he was doing it. Louis found himself in Nadia's spiritual world. He wondered if he would find in these black and murky waters the remains of Nadia's soul, over which Vine had wreaked havoc. Lucifer appeared behind the boy and reassured him, telling him that everything would be fine, for he would show him the way. Louis thanked him. Louis swam to the black hole and asked Lucifer where he should go. The apostle replied that it was right in front of him. In the black hole was Nadia. Louis called out to her, approached her, and took the girl's almost lifeless body in his arms. The magician asked Lucifer if he could save her using his method. The apostle replied that he would maintain her body for him. Louis decided to transfer all of his aura to Nadia. He urged her to open her eyes and speak, applying the magic of resurrection. A demon appeared to Nadia. He had already read her hidden thoughts that she hated being second, so he promised to give her the power that would allow her to reach the first place. The girl, when practicing summoning magic, accidentally opened a gateway to the sinister underworld. An insidious demon offered her a deal. Nadia knew it was wrong, but took his hand anyway. She didn't remember anything after that, but she knew that her heart had been defiled and turned into something disgusting. But she still couldn't do anything about it. She didn't understand anything anymore. She only felt darkness, coldness, and pain. She was afraid she would disappear without even apologizing to Giselle. Nadia didn't want that, and she didn't want to die. The girl was crying for help. Louis called out to her. He looked at her with a smile and promised that everything would be all right now. After all, he had come to save her. Louis offered her to go home. The girl burst into tears and hugged the wizard. When the girl opened her eyes, Giselle was hovering over her. She was in tears, and as soon as she saw that her friend was awake, she hugged her joyfully. Nadia sat down and apologized to Giselle, for it was as if she had been suddenly cursed by a demon or something. She admitted that she had made a mess of things, ending up risking her life and the lives of everyone else. The girl confessed to her friend that she was always jealous of her for being on top because she hated being second so she wanted to be better no matter what it cost her. Nadia was taking the demon's power and sadly said she didn't deserve her concern. But Giselle hugged her friend tightly and admitted she was the same because she too had given in to desire, even though she knew it was wrong. So they were the same. Giselle announced that Nadia was her precious friend and she was very glad she was alive. Nadia hugged the girl back and tearfully apologized. Fran watched the girls happily. She was happy for them, but she wondered why no one was talking about Lucifer. Even her mom stood silent after these thoughts. Suddenly, the apostle's voice sounded in the girl's head. He explained to her that his existence was taboo. Francisca immediately recognized that voice. Lucifer asked her not to worry because to speak to her he used teleportation. Others would not hear them. Lucifer told the girl that if anyone other than Louis, with whom he had made a contract, remembered his voice and mentioned his name, a terrible calamity would await him. Such was the fate bestowed upon him by his creator. Fran sadly exclaimed that how could that be, since he had saved her, and suddenly noticed that time had stopped. Lucifer explained that to make sure that no disaster would befall them, he asked them to cooperate with him and forget about him. And now Fran would do the same. But the girl didn't want to forget him, because he was her savior, Lucifer laughed and asked that she had sympathy for him, but promised that everything would be all right. More importantly, Fran had a problem because of wanting Louis to love her. The girl was confused. Lucifer explained that Louis's personality was under his strong influence, and he would detect people who asked for help and give them love. Louis did it all the time. Fran thought he was right. The apostle told her that the guy gave it to those who asked for it and she had to accept that fact, love him for it, or she would be hurt. However, Franziska was still able to recognize the connection between him and Louis, so he was sure that she could achieve her goal, and he disappeared. Fran suddenly found herself feeling as if she were talking to someone. The boys stood near the watchtower of the hunting forest, the superintendent announcing the results. The first was Giselle's group. After successfully defeating many ogres, they would receive 200 points. Next, Francisca's group, they had defeated ogres, 
orcs, a high-class ogre king and a high-class orc general, so they were getting 300 points. The superintendent asked the observers if any of the groups had committed an unscrupulous act. Adelaide replied that today's competition was completely fair. The superintendent was pleased to hear this and announced that, according to the final results, Francisca Sama's group had won. Everyone headed for their carriages. Louis called out to Giselle and excitedly wanted to say something, but she was interrupted by Nadia and said that since they had saved them and achieved victory, they were willing to do something as an apology and informed him that she and Giselle were ready to go out with him. The wizard was surprised. Nadia hastily bowed to him and whispered that she actually wanted to go alone, but asked him to accept her offer. Dragging quickly Giselle into the carriage shouted that they would see each other again. Fran stood next to Louis and asked what he would do now. Since these immaculate girls now had their eyes on him, the guy replied that he was only happy with her.